Thank you, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's really an honor. Um, <clears throat> so, the the talk today is going to be based on uh, work, joint work with Shang Tang at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, who's uh, unfortunately not here right now. And um, the, the, most of the talk is going to be about uh, work from this paper uh, that's called uh, From Double Lee Groupoids to Local Lee Two Groupoids. And um, it's uh, available on the archive. <clears throat> if there's time, I'll try to talk about some work in progress, but it's probably better for me to err on the side of, uh, of explaining this thoroughly than to um, try to throw too much material at you. So... <clears throat> The, the motivation for uh, what I want to talk to you about today uh, sort of comes from a you know, fairly simple observation. There, there are two different ways to define current algebraids, as probably most of you know. You can either have uh, a bracket that's skew-symmetric and then fails to satisfy the Jacobi identity, or you can have a bracket that uh, is not skew-symmetric uh, but does satisfy the Jacobi identity. And um, either way, you don't have a Lie algebra structure on the space of sections. Uh, but the, you know, you kind of feel like you almost have a Lie algebra. And uh, that point of view is, has actually been made uh, precise, I think, in a paper by uh, Alan Weinstein and Dimitri Reutenberg, where they, they show that there's actually a Lie 2 algebra structure there. Um, and so that's the sense in which it's almost a Lie uh, algebra. <coughs> And, uh, and so, even in the original paper by Leo Weinstein and Shu, I'm trying to make the backboard go up, there's this question that was posed, uh, what is the, the global groupoid-like object corresponding to a Krant algebraid? You know, if you have Lie brackets, you expect you should be able to integrate them to things like Lie groupoids. Here you have something that's almost a Lie bracket, and you'd expect it to integrate to something that's almost a Lie groupoid. Um, so th there's, there's been uh, a lot of work uh, that uh, sort of dates back to an, an old paper by uh, um, Dennis Sullivan in the 70s and then was used uh, in the specific context by Pavel Shavera and then in other contexts by Andre Enrique, who I'm not sure if he's here, um, and, uh, <coughs> and uh, Ezra Getzler in integrating L-infinity algebras. But uh, that approach used it leads to things that are infinite dimensional and um, can be kind of complicated to describe concretely. But but at least you can sort of intuitively work through the process and you get this idea, which I think should fairly be credited to, to Pavel, which is that the answer, whatever it is, it should be called a symplectic two-groupoid. Um, it's it's just a name, um, but uh, but the name you know has some meaning to it, and it sort of suggests what the answer should end up looking like. There should be something that uh, that you could call a two-groupoid, some higher object that's um, uh, that's like a groupoid, and then it should have something that's like a symplectic structure. So um, <clears throat> the question would be to say, okay, what is a symplectic two-groupoid? What is the precise definition? And how do those things correspond to current algebraids? So uh, Shang Tang and I sort of arrived at this problem from uh, a totally different question that we were looking at. We were studying this process that takes double Lie groupoids to um, to Lie two groupoids, uh, I'll say what those things mean in a second, but. <clears throat> Uh, and, and there's a, a connection to Utrecht, which is that we were interested in this because we were trying to understand a paper by um, Mordijk and Merchun about um, uh, the fundamental group of a stack. And that application is in the paper if you're interested, but I won't talk about that today. Um, but we realized that, okay, if you have something like this, wouldn't it be cool if you could just add the word symplectic to the picture?
and then you'd have a way to, to take symplectic double groupoids to, um, to symplectic two groupoids and in the process figure out what a symplectic two groupoid is. Um, <clears throat> so this is really what I w I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to first describe the, the part of the picture where there, there's no symplectic structure and you're just taking double E groupoids to lead two groupoids and in the process say um, what those things are. And then I'll add the symplectic structure back in and, um, and explain how this all relates to current algeroids. Okay, so here's the definition of a double Lie groupoid. Um, it's, it's a concept that goes back to um, Brown and McKenzie. Um, if you're okay with this uh, way of saying it, it's just uh, it's essentially a, a Lie groupoid in the category of Lie groupoids. Uh, but if you're not okay with that, there's kind of a simpler way of looking at it, which is to say that you have a square like this, where so G is a groupoid over M, H is a groupoid over M, and then there, you've got this D here, which has two different Lie groupoid structures, one over G and one over H. And um, if you have an element in D, you can sort of visually draw it as a, as a square, where the, the four edges correspond to the source and targets in G and H. Um, and you I didn't write it here in the conditions, but one of the things you want to uh, require is a compatibility that the, that the vertices are well-defined points in M, so that the target of these two arrows are, are the same point in M, and you know, same thing for the, the, other, four, uh, the other three vertices. Um, but beyond that compatibility condition, you, um, you require, this is sort of a technical thing, that you require this double source map which takes D to, to this pair of arrows here, the SG and the SH. Um, you require that to be a surjective submersion. Uh, this is the thing, uh, Rui used this in one of his talks. He said that one of his conditions was negotiable. Um, um, and that's true for this one. Uh, but for, for today, we'll, we'll assume that this is true, um, that it is a surjective submersion. Um, uh, and then there's this requirement that the fourfold products, where if you have four squares that are all, you know, meet up so that you can form a little uh, two by two grid out of them, uh, that, the, that the product is well defined. And what that means is that it, you can multiply horizontally and then vertically, or, or the other way around, and you get the same thing either way. And if you sort of unravel what that means, you'll end up with all the axioms that you need to define a uh, double E group with. Okay. So the, probably the, the, the best example to keep in mind is a, is a fairly simple one, where you start with a, a Lie groupoid G, and then you just take the pair groupoid of it. And that's a double Lie groupoid. You can try to take the fundamental groupoids of G and M, and that's what we, we tried to do in our paper. And you run into some trouble, and you have to, uh, um, to, to have a more general construction to make that work. Uh, but in nice cases, if, uh, if, if you have the path lifting property, if G over M uh, is a, is a sub vibration, then, then you can do that as well. Um, okay. So this is what uh, a double Lie groupoid is, and if if you uh, if, if you know about the uh, the nerve construction for a groupoid, where you can take a groupoid and you can take uh, its composable k-tuples and, and form a, a simplicial manifold out of it, uh, you can do something like that for the double Lie groupoid, you, and, and you can do it in both directions, and so you get a, a bisimplicial manifold. And so basically, what we did was that we. We took this double Lie groupoid not, not this one, but an arbitrary one and we turned it into a bisimplicial manifold
And then there's a construction that's um, a very old construction that's due to Artin and Major. Uh, which is called the bar functor. And that thing just basically collapses by simplicial manifolds into simplicial manifolds. Well, they did it for simplicial sets, by simplicial sets and simplicial sets, but the, the, you can throw in um, the smooth properties without any trouble. Uh, so, it's not the diagonal, but it's something where you're sort of uh, taking. Well, it's this diagonal, not not the thing that that goes this way. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, uh, luckily, I, I'm I'm not going to have to just explain to you what bisimplicial manifolds are, or how to get from here to here, or even what the bar functor is in general, uh, because there's a, a sort of a nice picture to describe the total process to go all the way from the left side to the right side. And so it looks like this. So you want to build a simplicial manifold, so you need to say what the zero simplices are, what the one simplices are, two simplices, and so on. Okay, so the zero simplices, um, I'm assuming that we're starting with a double E groupoid that looks like this, and where you can draw squares that look like that. Okay, so the zero simplices are just points in M. Okay, that part's easy. The one simple C is involved sort of taking a, a fiber product of things in H and things in G. And so the picture there looks like, I don't know if you can distinguish blue and, and green. Can you? Or should I use different colors? You can? Okay. So I'll use, <laughs> does it look like the same? I could use uh, yellow for one of them, maybe. And that looks white. Okay. Here, orange. Okay, so um, I'm using orange to describe something in G and blue to describe something in H. Maybe I'll... Do that here. Just to emphasize. Okay. So the pictures look like that, and as a as a space, it's just the fiber product of H uh, over M with G. And you we're using the source map here and the target map here, and because those maps are assumed to be submersions, this is smooth. And for everything that I'm gonna say, um, uh, for all the, the N simplices that you end up being able to to put smooth structures on everything because they're just fiber products over submersions. Um, <clears throat> so the one simplices look like this, and then the two simplices look like this. So you have H, this is something in H, this is something in D, this is something in G. Um, so H, things in H are yellow or blue. Things in G are orange. But I'm also going to color the the boundaries of, of alpha because those those are in uh, G and H as well. Uh, this one's in G, and uh, this one's in G. And then these two are in H. This should look familiar to you from David's talk, um, where, where he was looking at squares that had colored boundaries. Um, that, and, and he actually had double groupoids appearing in there. And he, he had double symplectic groupoids. Um, so he was one step ahead of me um, in this. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, but this is what the two simplices look at, and if you look like, and if you look at this carefully enough, you'll actually see um, it, you don't just want to describe the simplices, but you want to describe maps. Uh, three maps that go from here to here. Two maps that go from here to here. Hopefully those two maps are uh, obvious. Uh, but the three maps maybe wouldn't be obvious if you didn't have this nice picture. Um, but if you look at this, you can see exactly three things that, that look like this. There's, there's this little shape here in the corner. There's this one up here. And then there's a big one that goes over the top. And those are exactly the three maps that go from here to here. And in general, the... The, the n simplices sort of have something in H and then they have a sort of triangular array of things in D. Like that. So even though we're talking about you know, n, n dimensional things, really, uh, we're able to draw a two dimensional picture of them, which is convenient. At least until they develop n dimensional blackboards. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so, so this it has all the data of a simplicial set, and all the maps are going to be smooth and all that stuff. Um, but it turns out that it's not just uh, a simplicial manifold, but it's a two groupoid, a lead two groupoid. And what I mean by that is um, that you know there are these uh, horn m m maps that you can produce. Uh, so, say for example, from the two simplices, uh, you can just sort of take any any two of the three edges, and and then you, you'll get a pair of one simplices. So you can take this this edge and this edge, and you get a pair of one simplices. Or you can choose to take this edge and the big edge, get a pair of one simplices. And for for a groupoid, if you started with a groupoid and you took its nerve, all any of those maps that I just described, where you where you take a pair of edges and you get a pair of one uh, of one simplices, those maps are diffeomorphisms. If you because for a groupoid, the two simplices look like this. There's, there's like a G1 and a G2, and then the other edge is G, G1, G2. If you know two out of three of these edges, then you know the third one, because you can multiply and you can divide. Um, so for a groupoid, if you, if you have a two simplex, and, and, and if you know two out of three of its edges, you, you can actually identify the set of two simplices with, with the set of compatible pairs of edges. And, and that's exactly saying that the horn map is a diffeomorphism. So for a Lie 2 groupoid, it's the same idea, but it's one dimension higher. Uh, you require that, this, that the three simplices, if you, take, uh, if you take the three simplices and you take compatible uh, three tuplets of two simplices, uh, then the map taking a three simplex to all but one of its faces uh, is a diffeomorphism to the space of compatible triplets of two simplices. <laughs> and, and of course, there are higher dimensional versions as well. Um, but essentially what it means is that you can stop. Once you've, once you've defined the two simplices, that sort of has enough information. Uh, plus you need to have some sort of a, of a composition law. Um, but it's sort of similar to when you define a groupoid. You just need to define points and, and uh, arrows and a composition law, but you don't have to explicitly define the two simplices or the higher ones. That's really what a two groupoid is. Okay. And... Intuitively, you might say that because you can draw two-dimensional pictures of these things, it is a two, it, that, that sort of explains why it's a lead two group void. Okay. So, uh, so that's the, the general construction um, that I described earlier that takes double lead group voids to lead two group voids.
So when you add a symplectic structure to the picture on the left-hand side, uh, that's not something that, that we needed to do uh, new, newly. Uh, that was something that already existed. And as I said before, David mentioned it in his talk. Um, so a double Lie groupoid is uh, symplectic. if uh, D is equipped with a two form, uh, a symplectic form. That basically makes it into a, a, a symplectic groupoid with respect to both of its groupoid structures. Uh, D over G and D over H into symplectic groupoids. Okay, so this is a, a notion that um, I think first appeared in a, in a paper by. Uh, Lou and Weinstein, um, where they constructed the double symplectic groupoid of a, of a Lie algebraid, which is the, the thing that, that David talked about in his talk. Um, and the uh, sort of a general theory was developed by, by Carol McKenzie, and more recently, uh, Luca Stefanini described some uh, integration theory related to it. But there's a really nice picture here that uh, unfortunately isn't as well known as it should be, um, which is that symplectic double groupoids um, you don't really have to say Li because if, if you have a symplectic structure then you probably have a smooth structure already. Um, that symplectic double groupoids are the things that integrate Poisson groupoids. So I'm, I'm writing the arrow in the other direction because that's the differentiation. But they sit there like that. Um, Intuitively, the idea is that uh, Poisson groupoid is in particular a Poisson manifold. And you know that Poisson manifolds can be integrated to symplectic groupoids. If you do that to a Poisson groupoid, then the groupoid structure that you started with sticks around, and you end up with two groupoid structures. And, and you get a symplectic double groupoid. That's the idea. <clears throat> and of course, uh, we saw from a... a Enrique's talks last week that Poisson groupoids are the things that integrate Lie by algebraids. So you can differentiate a second time and get a Lie by algebraid. And I'd like to argue that really that the Poisson groupoid is is the is the odd thing in this picture because it's sort of anti-symmetric with respect to the two Lie algebraid structures down here or the two groupoid structures down up here. You sort of have to pick a direction uh, that to differentiate or to integrate uh, if you want to go from any of these two guys to the thing in the middle. Uh, but the symplectic double groupoid, uh, th that's a notion that's symmetric uh, with respect to G and H. And Lie algebraid is a notion that's symmetric with respect to A and A star. And, um, <clears throat> and so it's, it's probably, if you really want to talk about integrating Lie algebraids, you probably should go all the way up here. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a Lie algebraid, this is something else Enrique talked about in his talk. There's this... Uh, this double construction that's due to, to Lou Weinstein and Liu Weinstein and Shu, uh, which uh, takes Lie by algebraids to, to current algebraids. So 
So now you can sort of see how symplectic double groupoids are related to Cronth algebraoids. You could actually start with a symplectic double groupoid, go all the way over here, and get a Cronth algebraoid out of it. And uh, let me give you an example of a symplectic double groupoid that's, I guess, kind of the main example that you sh should keep in mind. It's just a special case of the, of, of the double groupoid I showed you there. Um, take any manifold and, and take its cotangent bundle, but view it as a groupoid. You know, where the source and the target are just the projection map and the, 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 the composition is just addition in the fibers. That's a symplectic groupoid. And if you took its pair groupoid that would be double symplectic as long as you're careful to, to put the appropriate signs on the, the symplectic forms on the, the two copies of T star M. Yeah. So this is uh, a symplectic it's a, it's a symplectic double groupoid and it's exactly the, the one, maybe not the one, but one of the ones that integrates the, the standard um, Cronth algebraoid structure, in a sense. I shouldn't say integrates, but that gives you the, the standard Cronth algebraoid structure if you go all the way through this process. Uh, the Lie Bi algebraoid it corresponds to is just TM, T star M, where TM has the canonical Lie algebraoid structure and T star M has the trivial one. So, so you'd get TM, T star M, and then if you turn it into a Cronth algebraoid, you get TM plus T star M. So you get the standard Cronth algebraoid, which is you know, safe to say that that's probably the main example of Cronth algebraoids that we care about. Um, there are others, obviously, but this is the big one. So there's this picture here, and hopefully I've drawn it to be a little bit suggestive, uh, that you kind of want there to be something else that's over here. The symplectic double groupoid still somehow remembers the, the fact that you had a Lie-Bi algebraoid. And you're sort of, when you take this double structure, you turn it into something where you, you, you kind of want to throw away the fact that, that, that your Cronth algebraoid is, is the sum of two Lie algebraoids. Um, and you just want to think of it as being something in and of itself. So you want to do something up here that, that throws away the distinction between G and H. And this, this process that I described up here seems to do something like that. So the idea, and this is a little bit of a linguistic argument, but the idea is that you turn this thing into... Uh, a Lie 2 groupoid, like a, uh, in that, using that process up there, you sort of see what happens to the symplectic structure that you started with over here. And whatever you get should be an example. It really deserves to be considered an example of a symplectic 2 groupoid. And then you hope that there's some way to go from here to here. Okay. Okay, well, so let's just see what happens. Let's suppose we started with a double groupoid that was a symplectic double groupoid. Um, we, we know we can apply this process and get a, a two groupoid. And the question is what happens to the symplectic structure? So uh, over there on the board on the top right, uh, I described the, the, you know, the low dimensional simplices of the two groupoid that you get. And let's just suppose that, that you had um, a symplectic double groupoid structure, then uh, 
uh, symplectic. Well then, uh, the symplectic form on D can, um, can pass to this uh, space of two simplices. Uh, which is uh, H fiber producted with D fiber producted with G. So this inherits a two form. Okay. Well, let's hope that it's compatible uh, with the two groupoid structure. Um, so what can we say about this thing? Uh, first of all, uh, it's going to be closed because, um, I mean, basically the way it inherits the two form is that you, you project from, from here to D and you pull it back. It's, it's the pullback of a closed form, so it's closed. Okay. It satisfies a multiplicative, t- multiplicativity condition. It's m- maybe not so obvious, but it's not so hard to check either. Multi- Um, And let me say what this multiplicativity condition is. Um, It's the natural generalization of this version of multiplicativity that uh, Enrique talked about for symplectic groupoids last week, where um, where you sort of look at the three maps. So he he looked at the three maps from the two simplices to the one simplices, which are the you know um, if since the two simplices are just two copies of G uh, that are composable, you project to the one copy, project to the other copy, and then multiply, and those are the three maps. And he didn't phrase it like this, but you take the alternating sum of of, uh, of the pullbacks of the two form, and uh, and you ask that that thing vanish, uh, and that's that's the multiplicativity condition for symplectic groupoids. Uh, for symplectic two groupoids, the multiplicativity condition is, is the same thing but one dimension higher. So you, you have four maps from the three simplices to the two simplices, and you take the alternating sum of the pullbacks of the two form, and you ask that that vanish. So if the face maps are Fi's, actually I need a minus one to the I. If I if I use Fi to denote the face maps, then then that's the condition that this should be equal to zero. Okay. Okay. And it satisfies this. If you start with a symplectic double groupoid, then the, the two form that you get over here does satisfy that. Okay. And Okay, so this is nice, but of course there's one thing that if you've, it, uh, probably many of you have already noticed that I've been ignoring, which is that uh, this thing is clearly not um, non-degenerate. It, you're pulling back a two-form along some, uh, a map that, uh, that has fibers that are non-trivial in general. Uh, so it's, it's going to be degenerate, which is kind of a bummer, but... Um, you can at least write down some conditions that control the, the, the degeneracy. And if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, the definition of pre-symplectic groupoid that, uh, that Enrique gave last week, where there was, uh, it wasn't just an arbitrary closed multiplicative two-form, uh, but there was some condition on the kernel, um, there was... Uh, the conditions here are sort of in the same spirit as that. So the, this is something that appeared originally in this paper, this big paper by uh, Burstein and Kranich and uh, Weinstein and Zhu. Um, about presymplectic groupoids integrating Dirac structures. And uh, there's also a paper by Ping. Um, 
which uh, I think it's called quasi-symplectic groupoids, um, which also has conditions where they, they control a degenerate um, two-form. Uh, so the conditions are sort of in the same spirit as that. The, the main thing, I don't really want to tell you exactly what they are, because they're a little bit complicated. But the, the main thing to take away from, uh, from this talk is that these conditions are completely defined in terms of the, the simplicial structure. It's completely, determined in, de- it's completely described by the face maps and, uh, and the degeneracy maps that go in the other direction. And so that allows you to axiomatize these conditions and sort of throw out uh, at least a, a, a tentative definition of what a symplectic two-groupoid is. Oops. And it's probably not the final answer to this story. Um, but... Uh, we can at least tend- tentatively say that we're looking for something that's a, that's a lead-to groupoid in the sense of being a simplicial manifold where the, the horn filling condition is, uh, is satisfied above uh, dimension 2 and uh, where you have a two-form that's closed and multiplicative and that satisfies these controlled uh, degeneracy conditions. Manifolds? Yeah, they are. They, I mean, they're, they're explicitly described by these these things. And so, as long as you start with a with a finite dimensional double E groupoid, then you're good. Oh, in general, yeah, you could allow them to be infinite dimensional. There's no reason um, to, to to rule out that case. Can you understand the Um. So what are you saying? Yo, you want to t- talk about differentiating? Is that ah? So yes. So the that's something that actually was done in um, a paper by David and Pavel, um, and that's that's important because so far, really, I drew this picture here, which is pretty, but uh, there's 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 no content act- that is actually um, proves that these things are related to these things, other than the fact that they sort of come from the same thing over here, but. But there is this uh, paper by uh, David and Pavel. where they did actually describe a way to do the differentiation, in particular to, to, to take the, the multiplicative two forms, the closed multiplicative two forms down. And, um, and they're able to, to, to verify that, that this, this diagram does commute. Um, but they, I should point out that they also um, gave an alternative uh, dis- description of a symplectic two-groupoid, which integrates the standard Courant algebroid, and even for um, Courant algebroids that are twisted by closed three forms. And, uh, and in their case, it's a local construction, but they actually have two forms that are non-degenerate on the nose. So, um, so th- there's. Uh, an equivalence that you have to worry about. The, 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 the thing that they described and the thing that, that we get from this construction, um, both can be said to integrate the standard Courant algebra. And if you, you know, if you start with this, you get something that, that integrates a standard Courant algebra. They, they describe something that integrates a standard Courant algebra, and they're, they're different. Their two form is non-degenerate. Our two form is degenerate. Um, and there's the question about. Why, why are these things, in what sense are these things equivalent to each other? Are you looking at the same dimension? Yes, and in fact, they, as two groupoids, they are uh, isomorphic to each other. Yeah. Is it always implicit that they're only considering current algebraids, which are doubles? Yeah, that is important. Yeah, so this, this construction doesn't work if you don't start with a double, which means, in particular, you can't twist by a three-form uh, unless you were to somehow generalize this in, in some way. Uh, but as it stands, it, it only works for doubles and, um, and doesn't work for, for twisted Courant algebraids. What was that? Probably have to get a three-groupoid that, I suppose. <laughs> maybe, maybe, yes. Yes. 
Um, yeah, so we've, we've thought about that. Um, but yeah, and then there might be a way to do that, to somehow enlarge this category here to, um, to allow for those types of things. But we haven't been able to, to make that work yet. Yeah. Um, okay. So I do have time, so let me just say something about the... I have 15 minutes still? Or? Okay, great. Yeah, so let me say something about the infinite dimensional... Um, story, which maybe will answer some of Marius's questions. Um, so, so this part of the talk really is is sort of in a different direction. Hope the, the result sort of uh, ends with something that, that looks the same in this sense, but. Uh, but it is uh, infinite dimensional, and it's 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 based very much uh, on um, Pavel Shavera's approach to integrating, um, which is a super geometric approach. So. I've, I've avoided talking about supergeometry explicitly, but uh, but it's it's behind the scenes here for sure. Um, so if you start with the standard Courant algebra, in, you can you can apply this this general construction that he has, and you can get this thing that's infinite dimensional. And, and uh, but it can be described fairly simply, even though it's even though it's big, as a two groupoid, it looks like this. You've got M as the zero simplices. You have paths in T star M as the one simplices. And for the two simple C's, it's, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's, it's not that bad. You have sort of maps from the boundary of the two simplex to T star M, uh, but they have to be filled by some homotopy class of things on the interior. So, So that, that star means uh, some sort of fiber product. In this case, the fiber product is over the maps from the boundary of, of the two simplex to M. But this stuff you can forget about if, um, if pi 2 of your manifold is trivial. So maybe it's better to... Um, to just pretend that that's true. And then you can ignore that part. So, and of course you could go higher, but it's a it's a two group void. So, uh, so this is basically enough information to describe the whole thing, and and hopefully it's fairly obvious what the what the face maps are and so on. Now this thing. Uh, you know, T star M has a, a, a canonical symplectic form on it, and and any anytime you have mapping spaces like this, you can you can um, you can get uh, a symplectic form on those things as long as you know how to integrate, and we know how to integrate along paths, and so we can do that. So this thing has a symplectic form. Now, if you compare this to the definition that I gave up here, you'd uh, see that this is a little bit weird. Um, this is the space of one simplices, and the space of one simplices has a symplectic form on it. Um, so that's not something that you maybe would expect to see in general. Um, but the point is that, okay, this has a symplectic form on it, and you can, you can take the alternating sum of the pullbacks to get uh, a symplectic form up here. And in fact, it's the same thing that you would put on here if you didn't ha do it that way. It, it, it's just where you, you integrate along the boundary instead of integrating along a path, and, and it's the same thing, right? So, 
So this has a symplectic form too. But it's just the, the simplicial differential of omega 1. And by simplicial differential, I mean that you took the alternating sum of the pullbacks. This part, even if pi, at pi 2 of m is tri is, isn't trivial, this part is sort of discrete. And, um, and so you can ignore it for the purposes of putting symplectic forms on. So the point is that uh, this one, that you, you know, you had this uh, two form on the space of one simple C's, but it wasn't uh, uh, multiplicative. So it wasn't a symplectic, it wasn't anything like a symplectic groupoid. But uh, you took the alternating sum of the pullbacks here, and because this thing is a differential, uh, now you've got something that is multiplicative. And it's closed, and it's non-degenerate, and so um, so it's a symplectic two-groupoid. Now, the, just just so I don't have to keep writing all this out, I'll call this x two. Okay. Now, the, the the general theory of this super geometric approach tells you that if you had a Dirac structure that it would integrate to a Lagrangian sub-2 groupoid. So, so let's suppose we have um, this Dirac structure. then this should integrate to this Lagrangian sub-2 groupoid. So I'll call the, 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 the space of two simplices here L. And that should sit inside the x2 over there. And uh, down here, there are Lagrangian sub two groupoids that don't sit over M, that have something smaller here, but uh, the ones that you get from Dirac structures will have all of M down here. And the thing that appears in the middle is actually just the, uh, the A paths. Um, which. Uh, so for those of you who were here last week, and Rui was talking about the, the cotangent paths for T star M uh, when you had a Poisson structure, this is the sort of Lie algebraic generalization of that. If you have a Lie algebraic structure, which you do if you have a Dirac structure, then you can talk about A paths. And um, that's the space of A paths, the full space of A paths is here. Okay. okay. And so that's sits inside the, the path in T star M uh, because if you have a path in A you can just take the T star M component of it. Um, and it looks like I'm losing information. It looks like I'm just throwing away the TM component and, and that I shouldn't be saying that this is an, inc an inclusion. But it's actually true that you're not throwing away information and I'll, I'll let you figure out why. Um, so the A paths uh, sit inside the, 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 the space of all paths in T star M. And and then there are two forms everywhere. So let me use some colors to describe this. Uh, no, just all paths. Ah, uh, so this is um, so we, we're not really composing the way that you want to compose. We're, this is like taking the fundamental two-groupoid in the simplicial model, where instead of actually um, saying, okay, you're going to concatenate the paths, you've, you put a two-simplex in. That, um, yeah, you could say that you're working up to, um, uh, up, basically up to homotopy in, in that sense, but you're not, you're, not dis, you're not portioning out the paths by homotopy. The multiplication works up to homotopy. Does that make sense? <laughs> that, that you, you've got a whole bunch of two simplices that, that could fill a horn, and, and uh, multiplication is sort of ill-defined in that sense. 
say that uh, the multiplication is well defined as a, as a by bundle of two points, and not as a, 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 as a bundle. Ah, right. So the, the, the space of triangles gives you the by bundle uh, between the couples of the pairs of one simple system and uh, well, the other base. Okay. Great. Okay, so we have this, this two form here that I, that I called omega 1. And you have the two form here that I called omega 2. Um, and these two are related to each other because this is the, the simplicial differential of the omega 1. And uh, as I said, L is supposed to be a Lagrangian sub 2 groupoid. So when you pull omega 2 back, you get 0. And because this is a simplicial map, the, the, the diagram commutes in terms of pulling back things. So <clears throat> this thing pulls back to something. Um, I guess if this map is I, it pulls back to some I star omega. And so you, you get this two form on the space of A paths. And actually the formula um, is exactly the one that um, that, that was used originally to put a presymplectic two form um, on uh, the, the Dirac groupoids that integrate, or the presymplectic groupoids that integrate Dirac groupoids. Yeah, yeah, they are. This is, yeah, this is the, the simplicial differential. Yeah. Yeah, the alternating sum of the pullbacks of the face map. Yeah. So. <coughs> So the key point here is that because this diagram commutes, uh, this is D of, uh, of this I star omega, um, which means that I star omega is multiplicative. And that sort of explains, you know, in, in a sense, why you, you end up with a two form when you integrate. Dirac structures, uh, because you, you take this, you, you're taking this two form here, you're pulling it back to here. Now you've got some, you didn't have a multiplicative two form here at, on the space of one symbolicies, but you have a multiplicative two form here uh, on the space of A paths. And, um, and then actually to get the, the presymplectic groupoid, you have to quotient out by homotopies that appear up here. So you're not completely done yet. But, um, but once you have a multiplicative two form, then, then that survives this, uh, this quotienting out by homotopies. And, um, and that, that sort of explains why you get this presymplectic structure when you integrate Dirac structures. So, okay. Um, so that's everything I wanted to say, I guess, a little bit early, but thank you.